I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Jesse Holtzman, who's, uh, you know, we, we, we felt like something was missing in the Cardiners Academy. The focus for the Academy is really to advance digital education. And we said, you know, there, uh, we, we, we feel and see and experience so many profound things in our care of patients. Uh, and we rarely take a moment, uh, together to appreciate that. And so we wanted to create a, a space, um, like this to be able to, to celebrate the humanism in medicine. And Jesse really took the lead in designing what we call the humanism, uh, medical humanities block and put together some great materials some great thoughts. That's really, I think, inspired a lot of us to think about how to reconnect with some of these reasons why we decided to become doctors, but some, you know, forgot along the way. And this whole book club idea and the choice for this book and to invite you was all driven by Jesse. So Jesse, yeah, I'm going to let you take it away here. Thanks team. And I think we've already accomplished our goal, which is honestly just an excuse to all get together and to read and to reflect. And so I think we have done what we have come to do. Um, and we're so grateful to you, Dr. Ely, for joining us. Uh, in terms of sort of what we had envisioned for today, I was hoping that we could, you know, maybe spend 10, 15 minutes just getting to know Dr. Ely. I know we've read a lot about your life, but we'd love to hear it from you. And then we can sort of open it up. But I have some guiding questions that we can just discuss together sort of as a, a jumping off point to reflect together. Um, and then we'll try to get us out of here by the end of the hour so that everyone can go back to their lives. Absolutely. And um, if you don't mind, I'll just kind of get started on this. And then really the most excited about just the crosstalk and the, and the questions from all of you make it very clear I'm here for you and not the other way around and um I think it's something that just popped in my brain is that my or uh he, he's actually not in the book his name is C Thorpe Ray like C period Thorpe Ray and when I was in medical school C Thorpe was a very very famous bedside clinician because he made a bet with any medical student at Tulane, that if we could hear a murmur, because you're all cardio nerds, you're going to love this. If we could hear a murmur that he could not feel with his, with his hand, that he would take them out to dinner. And he never lost that bet. He, and I asked him, Dr. No, Dr. Ray, what, how did you come to realize that you could feel? And he used this hypothenar eminence, this, this portion of his hand to feel the murmur first. So he was my first mentor, physical diagnosis mentor. And he would use that portion of his hand. Now it's still to this day, that's the portion of my hand that I use to feel murmurs. And he said, you know, I just realized that I could feel these as well as I could hear them. And before echocardiography, that was a tool he developed. We each and every one of you can choose to develop your own toolbox, something that you're gonna carry around with you to the bedside with all of your interactions for the rest of your lives as a physician. And being a physician is not being a provider, okay? It is not being a provider. You will, but it's way more than that. And so we have to, this is an art. And that's why I ran so much shame so many years because when I left Tulane and went just all full tilt into I just thought this is science. It's all about science and technology. I need to get that intubation. We need to get that central line. And all that technology that I can bring to the bedside is my art. I mean, it's my practice. But as you can look in the EDDB, I just realized that something was desperately missing. And I wasn't being a complete healer. Science isn't enough to heal a human being. We have to have the touch first and then the technology. And, uh, and don't get me wrong, I am unabashed, complete geek about science. In fact, I'm going to show you this one thing because I probably won't come back to it yet, but let me share my screen. Oh, you disabled me. You can put it up. You, you share your screen. Is it, I mean, who has it? Share your screen and then pull up the internet. I'm going to share, you can, you can share right now, Dr. Dr. Okay, you're now share. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to share my screen too. And I'm going to go over here. I'm going to put up the internet. Um, now I'm looking at my second screen here. I'm going to go down to our website, which is, which is the critical illness, brain dysfunction survivorship. So CIBS website, it's the website. And there's a book page here, but what I want to show you is this under medical professionals, 
If you go over to discovery timeline right here and click it, I built this for you guys because y'all are nerds. Look at this. This is amazing. I, if I say so myself, 1850, 1944, 1952. This is, and every one of these links is a paper. These are the links and the birth of the bundle. There's the B, the D, the A. The D. So all of this is coming down. This is my first, this is my paper that I did when I was at the New England Journal of Medicine in 1996. But as you come on down, all these are the papers and the years and the build of the bundle. You finally get to A, B, C, D, E. Here's all this. Keep on going. Keep on going to the modern day, to 2021, et cetera. So um, use that. If you want to know this literature and, 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 you know, figure out what's going on, it's all real. It's all science and you know, it's all there. And, um, here, if you go to this book page, um, is the, there's a book, this guy discussion here, here's a movie, but here's the photo gallery of the patients. You know, here's the duck lady you read at the very beginning. Here's my Angelou. Here's Marcus Cobb. Okay. Marcus Cobb is the guy that was a smurf. He was blue. And here he's holding his own art. Yeah. And notice he's not blue anymore. So this guy right here, Robin Pearson, he, he authored the, the editorial on xenotransplantation for MGH last New England Journal. He was my co-trans, he was the surgical director of transplant and I was the, the medical director of transplant. Uh, anyway, that's enough of that. I just wanted to show you those tools. But, so. So to me, it's the beauty of being a nerd is that we can also build our toolbox to have this real sensitive side to us that says, I'm, I'm willing to cry with you. I will kneel down. I will look in your eyes. I'll hold your hand. And it's, it's crushing to me, but I, when you get sick and when you don't, when you're not going to, when you're going to, if you're going to die, it's going to crush me, but I don't want to live any other way as a physician anymore. And it's going to be a burnout prevention program for me to dive in deep into your illness. Maybe even I feel like I'm, I'm being reckless with my part at this time, but that is the fullness of being a physician. And so that was the journey for EDD, of EDDB for me. And I'll just kind of stop there and see what kind of people are wondering. I like that's such a, a poignant point that you're making, Dr. Ely, which we had a talk earlier this year on growth mindset or growth mindset versus performance mindset. And I think a lot of the talk was sort of convincing us that sometimes the softer skills are, it's not, it's not, it's not being soft. It's scientifically driven. It's actually ends up with better outcomes. And though for so long, it was so stigmatized to be that soft, caring, kind, you know, physician that that is in fact both evidence-based and protective for ourselves as well as our patients. Well, if, if we don't nurture this side of us, I mean, all, most of you are interested in cardiology, so you're going to be heavily technology driven. You allow yourself to be overwhelmed by that. But remember what happened in COVID. We allowed fear of a disease, just like we might allow fear of our heart getting hurt. Like when Osler wrote about equanimitas, you know, my mother, when I was in medical school, my mother gave me a leather bound copy of equanimitas. And I read that and, you know, I think when my dad left us when I was little and my mom raised us, I really was in survival mode as a kid. And I thought, how am I going to do this? You know, I'm kind of a surrogate dad in my house. I've got to rise to the occasion and make it okay for my little brother and sister and try and make it okay for my mother. Um, and so I just kind of started figuring, solve every problem. I can, I can control every circumstance. And, um, and I took that with me into critical care and to medicine, which is, I think I can, I can fix everything. I can be a fixer. So when I read equanimitas and Osler said, you know, pull back a little bit, protect your heart. I overused his advice and, and assets that are overused become liabilities. So what happened is that I took an asset that Osler was trying to help me with which was an even healedness in my life, which is all he meant was balance. Overused, pulled away and removed myself from being a full healer for my patients. And in so doing, I allowed my to get more hurt that, because I wasn't getting any of the beauty of the, of the rest. I mean, I don't want you to think that I was ever like some cold hearted, you know, jerk off doctor. I mean, I was always loving my patients, et cetera, but I was doing too much at a distance 
and I let them be just sedated and mobilized and I didn't see it there enough. So anyway, I guess I'll close this by saying this portion by saying that if we will try, each of us has to try and find our own balance in this way at the bedside. And I think if you let yourself be vulnerable with these people, they will let you in their life. And when they let you in, it's completely priceless. And each of you knows this on occasion, but what are we doing every day our trip so that it becomes the, the core part of who we are as physicians rather than just something stuck on to our knowledge about echoes or swans or whatever. Well, that's a perfect segue and so wise. So I wonder um, if we can sort of transition into our first question that I'm going to open up to everyone. Um, sort of based on on what you were saying, Dr. Yui. And so I, I based all these questions on quotes because I, like all of you, sort of found myself like marking down and like checking off, like cornering pages along the way of stories that resonated with me. So I'll read you one of the quotes that resonated with me and then I'll sort of open it up to you guys. Um, but so this was actually in the prologue before the book even started. I think one of the most poignant parts probably. Um, and Dr. Yui wrote, uh, our greatest treasure is found in deep, real communication with each other. When this is nurtured, especially in times of suffering, two people can establish something of almost myth mystical quality, a reciprocal connection that brings us to a place of charity and empathy that crosses cultural, social, and racial boundaries. Without such communication, we remain miles apart. And I feel like, you know, throughout throughout your book, Dr. Ely, you really prioritize sort of finding the person and the patient, as you said. And so I'm wondering when you were all reading this, if you had thoughts on sort of how we as healthcare professionals can re reduce depersonalization in the ICUs as well as sort of on our hospital floors. And then what can we be doing in our daily practice to, to really maximize person-centered care? Um, I, I have two, I have two little tools, but I'd love to hear if you, you want me to go first, you have to let other people share, share their thoughts. Either way, it's totally up to you. I'll give you two quick little tools. I, you know, my brain can't keep all this stuff in the RAM. In my, in my RAM. So I, I can't keep all of this. What I have to do is I have to distill it down into something that no matter how busy I get, I've got th these few nuggets of ways to get me there. So what I do is when I foam in and foam out, as I'm walking in the room, I, I hit the foam on my hand. I say four questions. Now remind myself, let me ask these four questions. So if I'm first trying to visit somebody, either the patient themselves or their loved ones, if the patient is incompetent because of um, my own drugs or disease, I want to know, can I start with the lob, what I'll call the lob, the, 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 the first tier. And that is, I would like to know this person's pet, pet's names, food, favorite music, and hobbies. Okay, so I was wanting to know pets' names, food, music, and hobbies. Some some group of that. And if I get that information from the patient or from the loved one, I have found that it becomes impossible for me to not treat that person as a whole person. Because once I know their foods, their music, their pets, and their hobbies, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is an actual person. I can no longer depersonalize you. But that's only the first step, okay? And I know when we're in a hurry, we can't do all of this at once. So it might be that you have to kind of get like some quick information about their angina and then I come back for these four things. So figure out how to do it. But I, I wanna make sure I get that information. But then there's a second tier of questions and I make sure I try and learn that first day. And this is, I cannot tell you how many times this has saved my ass in terms of taking care of the person. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to you. And if it's not, would you like to tell me about another thing that was harder for you? And right off the bat, whether their answer is yes or no, I'm diving down in deep with it. Now, it may be that they don't talk about the worst thing that happened to them. You can think of many things that could be too sensitive. But I make a, the way I do it is I make a space for that that it's okay either answer, but I want them to know that I care about them in that way. And a quick story is, a woman came in, chest pain, because of her chest pain, ended up getting calf, exercised, um, all the studies, it was all negative. 
And when it was all said and done after a full cardiac workout, which was negative, this is a perfect story for cardio nerds. The medical student sat down at her bedside and said, I'm so sorry that we couldn't carry out what was wrong with you. And she said, it's just so weird. And now I've got, I've got to go back out of here tomorrow and face the real situation, what's going on with me. And the med student said, well, she said, well, the day I came in here, I found out that my husband was having an affair. That was the whole thing, but nobody asked. So my, my way of doing it to, to stop the personal is to find out who that person is and I try by making myself ask this question. Other thoughts and comments, I'd love to learn. Patrick? That was so beautifully said. And um, Jesse, I'm so happy you mentioned that particular quote. Can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm so happy you mentioned that particular quote because my, you know, as much as I loved every single chapter and the way you wrote every single one of them, my favorite one was about, about making the patient feel seen. And I didn't really have to highlight or underline this quote because I'm going to remember it, but the ICU and actually writing it out as ICU, something that resonated a lot with me is how we have a lot of, as physicians, we have a lot of checklists. And sometimes we forget that behind every check is a huge story for the patient. Like, um, what affected me a lot was when you were saying, like when we're obtaining social history, sometimes patients think that that's like a conversation starter, but for us, it's, we just need to check it off so we can put it in the HNP, for example. And I don't want to get lost into that. And, and every person's social history is a conversation starter for them. But, but I felt like I didn't want it to just be a checklist on the HNP. Um, so that's something that really resonated that first part of, of, of the chapter about, um, making patients feel seen is to remove the idea of every patient has their own checklist and rather that the questions that we have, it's okay. If they're conversation starters, it's okay. If I ask where you live and you're, you're able to tell me a whole story about the patient's able to tell me a whole story about that. And I don't just take that for, okay, now I have that check mark, but about the way I approached, uh, this idea of patients being felt seen is two things in my life, along with the book I read from you is one of my attendings always um, at Grady Hospital always told me or did not let us present a patient unless we shared a story of the patient first. So he would not listen to the to the, the HPI unless we said this is a male or female who used to work at the airport as a chef and used to do this and that. He would not listen unless we started with that. And then I got so used to it that it's almost becomes unusual when I hear a story, uh, you know, I hear an HPI without hearing the story about the patient. So that's something that resonated a lot with me. When we say things like, oh, there's an admission or, oh, the cap is seven. Like these are numbers. These are terminologies we use about patients who really have so much value, so much stories. So I always stop and say the cap. Okay, sure. It's seven patients, but it's not just a number. We are we have the privilege of taking care of this this amount of patients tonight. Let's do it. Don't don't call it an admission. No, there's there's someone who needs our help, and we're going to be there for them. And that chapter of the patient being seen was I read it twice. Um, it was like it so it was so the that ICU will stick with me forever. And I felt like just reading that chapter continued to make me a better person. So just I have more of a comment than a question. But thank you again. Um, for the book and that particular chapter. Oh, thank you so much for saying this. I, 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 I just, it makes me a little bit speechless to think about the fact that we all get to connect on this because it's all of our book. It's all of our ability to dive out into these stories and to see and to make it grow in us. Uh, you know, Maya Angelou, you know, she, she spoke to me when I was a little boy as I was reading her book. And then when I got to care for her, but at the end of the book, I talk about, and this fits into what you were just saying, I met her son, Guy Johnson, who's a poet. And remember, I asked him, what did your mom, what was it like growing up with your mother? And he said, you know, it was always nothing he deserved. I grew up in her light and uh, always something that expanded him, he said. But then I said, what did she, something that she taught you? What, what, do you, what did she teach you that nobody knows? And the only place that this quote is in, in my Angelou quote is anywhere. He, he gave it permission. She, he said, son, I write from a black perspective, but I aim for the human heart. 
could there be a better quote for the cardio nerds to write from the, whatever perspective you bring, each one of you has your own skin color, racial background, socioeconomic background, educational background. Each one of you brings your own upstream things from your life. Um, whether it be peace or trauma or up or down, high cycles, low cycles, you bring all of that with you and you can take all of that. We can all aim for that human heart. And then we find our common purpose. You know, we are here to serve those tougher people. And I think if we can join together on a common purpose, but imagine if each one of us teaches another 10 and those 10 teach another 10, those 10 teach another 10, that's the butterfly effect that we can help to create and start right now tonight in this cardio nerd. So I appreciate you. Yeah. I'll can't hear you. I wish we could. Colin, um, and another option is, I don't know if you're on your phone or your laptop is to connect with another device. And, um, if you try that, you can probably just hot click on, you will use that. But we One can't... of the things that uh, the guy Johnson talked about was cultural empathy. And, you know, he really did a good job of, uh, of that. I wonder if that meant anything to any of you. Um, uh, where is guy Johnson's commentary? Oh, here it is right here. Um. After he said that on the human heart, we, we talked about the challenges that racial tensions bring up for society and individuals. And the way the pandemic had shown that some communities are more vulnerable than others, it made me stop and think about how I could change my work as a doctor for the better. And I shared this with him. Mr. Johnson seemed to understand and told me of the need for society to embrace a spirit of cultural empathy. As Mr. Johnson spoke, I was intrigued by his words. I could see how it would be better for my patients if I developed a heightened awareness of their cultures, in addition to getting to know them as individuals. So much I wanted to know about him, his life. It made me think, what if I were meeting him as a patient in my ICU? Would I have so many questions? The, de the depersonalization chamber sprang to my mind. That's just what I can't allow to happen anymore. I can't allow myself to depersonalize these people because I know that I'm not providing real care for them if I do that. And so I wonder how that resonates with any of you and what that means for you in your life as a physician. Bob, yeah. Um, Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, just really resonating with me because uh, yesterday I had a moment actually on call where I, you know, when you're in the ICU and you're on call, you spend so much time with everyone's families, especially and getting to know people through their family members and, um, you know, all the different people that visit them and the stories you hear from them. It's it's so special and you, you really get to know them. I would argue you probably get to know them the most out of anywhere in the hospital. Um, but I did have that moment where I was like, man, you know, this person's going for a VAD today or they're going for an impella or they're getting cannulated and I, I'm so scared that they're going to bleed out or um, something's going to go badly. And I, I just wonder how you um, have kind of tackled handling that um, connection to people that can make it really, really difficult and still, um, you know, you just, you have this moment where you're like, man, I, this would really crush me if it went badly. And you still have to be awake for another 30 hours and do your job and put in those crash central lines and take care of everyone. So just wondering how you manage that. Sure. Good. I'm glad you asked that question. You know, I mean, you can see my great hair. I mean, I've been around doing this thing for over 30 years. And before when I had, you know, dark brown hair and I was just the beginning, that's what I was worried about too. Um, but these years go by fast and now I'm worried that I won't have enough of those intimate relationships. Um, it, it actually almost makes me cry to think that it would ever come to an end. And the richness that I get from being with these people, these, these people who let me into their life when I don't deserve it. I mean, I don't deserve to have the intimate knowledge of all these things in their life, but they're still willing to share it with me so that I can fully understand who they are and, and do my best. You know, let's just talk about mercy for a second. 
You know, so if we are to provide mercy for somebody who's suffering, then what does it really mean? And, and for a long time, my definition was to dive into their chaos. So my definition of mercy was to dive into the chaos of another person's life. But I realized after a while, that's not, that's not enough. It's got to have a second portion to the definition. So my, my working definition of mercy now is to dive into the chaos of their life and provide lifting and healing. I now view my original definition of mercy as false mercy. Because I could dive into chaos by doing anything, putting somebody on a ventilator, getting them a cat, you know, putting a swine, whatever it may be. But am I providing lifting and healing? Not necessarily. Now it might be, but it might not be. So you ask me, what if this, what if I get into this relationship and the, and the procedure goes bad? Well, I'm going to keep doing the same thing, which is I'm going to dive into your chaos and provide you lifting and healing. And sometimes in my diving in, I actually might increase your chaos because you might get a complication from me. You know, I might miss that intubation. I might create a pneumothorax. Um, I might create a bleed, you know, and I've done all of those things. And at the same time, I will stay a hundred percent committed to you to try to continue diving in and providing you lifting and healing. The journey will not be linear, but that's the very being a physician is that my relationship with you may not be linear. The thing I can promise you is I will not leave you. I will not abandon you. And so that's kind of where I am now at the age of 58, old guy. And I just, as long as I, as I hold my commitment to them not to abandon them, and that doesn't mean I'm always on call. Like somebody might take over my, my service. That's not what I'm talking about. When I'm supposed to be there, I'm not going to abandon. So I hope that that helps a bit. Thank you so much. That was so powerful and beautifully said. I think my audio might work now. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, it only took me 45 minutes. <laughs> Um, hey, my, my name is Colin. Sorry, I was having so many technical issues here. I'm a pancardiology fellow and former uh, Osler house staff. Um, just kind of jumping off what PZ was saying earlier, I feel like, so, uh, you know, bringing this back to, to Hamid a little bit here. Um, so he was uh, a bunch of our um, essentially chief uh, residents when we were uh, at Hopkins and in, in interns. Um, and and I like distinctly remember him incorporating similar to what PZ was saying is every patient's one liner needed to have an interesting fact in it. And I remember it it initially started out as you know there are some times where um, you would have twenty patients that you had to pre round on and write notes on on a weekend, um, and it was initially seen I think as like. An, an arduous task and some patients would be like, well, I don't know anything interesting. And it would like take, take a while to, to dig down. Um, but I, I think as the year went on and we all realized how much more we were learning about our patients, how much more we were connecting with our patients, um, how it really helps their care. You know, we, um, started to embrace it a, a lot more and, we had some very interesting stories that we learned about people that we never would have learned. For example, uh, one of our patients worked on the Manhattan Project um, and had uh, cool conversations with him about that experience. Um, the probably the most famous, not not famous to, to maybe anyone outside of Hopkins, but um, we were mildly obsessed with the biscuits that the Hopkins cafeteria serves uh, in the morning. And one of our patients actually, uh, that was her recipe. And we, we found out that she was responsible for the biscuit recipe that we, uh, would get for like, you know, 375 in the morning for a biscuit and hash grounds and, oh, those biscuits were so good. And she was like a celebrity after that, um, <laughs> because it was her biscuit recipe. And I, I think that that's something that really stuck with me after intern year and um, and, and this is something that I think a, a lot of people know, but uh, as PZ said, we're kind of, we're kind of all family here. Um, the, my son, who's two and a half now and, uh, who's, who's doing quite well, he has a, a pretty rare genetic disorder. 
And um, he's had uh, struggles with gross motor uh, basically since he was born and been in physical therapy since he was three months old. Um, and he's, he's doing uh, very well, all things considered, but it gave me a very different perspective on this, uh, the humanism aspect, especially with a child and um, there's so much unknown and you don't know what's going on initially. And, um, you have people who are trying to help you figure it out. Uh, the doctors that really like our, our PCP was just unbelievable. Um, and his, uh, pediatric neurogeneticist was, was just incredible. And that, you know, it, it's those people who really stick with you, who treat you like people and treat you like a, a real person and understand kind of the fears and the, um, the things that are, are driving you, uh, when you're kind of on the other side of things and, and dealing with the difficulties of the medical system. And it's, it, it's very, very, very hard as someone who is a, a literally a, a doctor in the medical system, getting your family member or child um excellent care is a massive amount of work it takes a lot of time um and i think i it really gave me a, a deeper appreciation for the clinicians who really do try to connect with you than just like see you like okay bye see you in a year and and leave the people who follow up with you when you're not in the office to see how you're doing and just kind of call you out of the blue to say hey i know things have been tough how are you doing the um you know, those sort of, that's a five minute conversation, maybe with your PCP, but that's a very powerful, uh, five minute conversation for the person who's kind of struggling to, to deal and come to terms with everything that's going on. Um, which I try to sort of pay it back slash forward. Um, you know, I, I feel like as a resident, I my inbox was sort of a chore, right? Like all this stuff comes into the Epic inbox and it's like prescription requests and calls and people talking about this and that. And you're just like, oh, like this is, this is a thing you have to clear. But when I was on the other side of it and like waiting for results and waiting for inbox messages for the doctor to get back to me and tell me what this test meant and what this genetic test meant and, you know, what this meant for, for my son, it, it gives you, you know, two days of response doesn't seem like very much when you're the provider. Um, but when you're the patient who's waiting for a, a critical, potentially life-changing result, it's, it's a huge deal. Um, and it, it really put sort of even something as simple as the in-basket into a, a different perspective, that these are all people who don't know what's going on and just need someone to reach out to them and, and help them. And, um, I think I have, a it gave me sort of a different perspective on, um, something just as simple as that. Wow. That's so powerful. And first of all, what is your son's name? His name is Clark. Clark. Okay. I'm going to be thinking about you and Clark. Yeah, Colin, I appreciate you so much for telling us about Clark and what a beautiful thing you're showing, uh, as a parent. And you're also being vulnerable about how that experience as a parent has changed you as a physician. Uh, I think you and I have a lot in common. If you think back to chapter six in the book, when my daughter fell off the high diving board and she is now, uh, 28 and she wrote to me today and said, dad, thanks for bringing me into the world. Her mom brought her into the world, but, um, she has, she has lived with, you know, uh, PTSD and, and TBI in her whole life now. And, uh, that how I learned it on the other side of that bet, you know, that was the title of that chapter was figuring out, oh, this is not the way I want to be a doctor. And I suspect, I suspect that Clark has changed the way you want to her and the experiences you had, you know? No, absolutely. And I think that that's, that's really, um, you know, everyone obviously has their portion of the book that sort of spoke to them the most. And, uh, that obviously struck a nerve, um, uh, with me specifically, it, it's just, uh, it's a very different experience. It really just kind of change you. And I'll just, I'll just share something with all of you. This is not advice. I'm not here to give you advice, but 
that experience with, with Taylor was so hard that, um, like I'm a swimmer, so I swim all the time. And every time I'm like, swimming and I, I'll relive the fact that she fell and crashed and I, I'll just, in the pool, I'll just yell and ah, let's scream like that out. And years later, you know, 20, 30 years later, 20 years later anyway. Um, and what I've, what I've come to in the past year or two is this, that the past and the future are, and I know this sounds obvious and I know it's on paper. You all have thought we did this already, but the things I can't control are the past, the future and other people. And the things I can control are the present moment and myself. So if I am going to focus my attention on something that I can do anything about at all, it really boils down to my, myself and how I choose to make decisions in the moment, in the present moment. And that's the easier said than done. But I'm doing is every day I'm working and training myself through prayer and counseling to, to try to learn that, that those past experiences, they, and as physicians, we carry all this stuff with us. We, it molds in our brain, but they really are over. I mean, they're, they're completely over. There's nothing I can do about it. Learn what I can from it and move on. Stay in this present moment, and ninety percent of the things I'm going to worry about won't come to won't come to pass anyway. So they say worrying is like a, a rocking chair. You're doing something, but you're getting nowhere. So you know. Uh, anyway, the experience that I have had with Taylor has taught me that, and to try and stay in the moment, focus on my own issues, my overused aspects, and um, so those are just a couple of thoughts about that. By the way. Uh, Let's get this in the chat. You can look it up. There's a paper I just published in Chest in the Humanities section of Chest. It was in the um, September issue of 2021, and it's called Medicine at Its Finest. So if you just Google the E E W Medicine at Its Finest, you'll find this. But the reason I'm bringing it up is that it talks about a patient experience that I had where. I would have completely missed it in my earlier self as a physician. But what I did this time was I, I asked the mother to teach me about her son with those four questions and, and to dive deeper. And it completely changed the entire experience. So it's a place where I wrote down what I was telling you earlier, the little toolboxes I carry with me to try and avoid dehumanization. Um, other thoughts or comments from anybody? Um, yeah, I, I wanted to mention, um, you know, I was co-intern with Colin. So Ahmed was our uh, chief ACS and, you know, he really taught us to, um, like how to, you know, treat patients, not as patient, but everyone has their unique uh, story and really learning something interesting, finding something interesting about every patient. And I remember that many patients were surprised or shocked whenever I asked them, you know, tell me something interesting about yourself. And that just kind of also reflects on, you know, how rarely as physicians, we ask our patients um, personal questions, because I feel most of the times they were very surprised when I did try to sit down and learn about them. Um, and I do admit, you know, uh, over the years and uh, now as hospitalist, I get busy with doing discharges, admissions, uh, multi-D meetings, and I, 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 I am guilty of not um, sitting down and asking all my, all my patients right now, you know, something interesting about them. And Dr. Ely, after I read your book, um, even just the prologue, you know, I, I, now I'm starting to ask all my patients again, something interesting and to learn something personal about every single one of them because what made me to be a doctor in the first place is to be a healer to you know help those around me and on um, the book just reminded myself again why I decided to be or why I wanted to be a doctor in the first place uh, so I want to thank you for that and I'm also curious um you know you, you did mention you kept note cards about all the patients uh people that survived and people that didn't and I do wonder you know, how do you remember, do you still use uh, the note cards to help remind yourself, you know, all the patients you met, or do you have a newer system? Because, you know, honestly, I definitely do not remember all the personal stories I talked about with my patients and would 
uh, love to hear, you know, what methods you use. Sure. Thanks. Well, first of all, just a, just another little thing that what I do is, um, when I'm meeting people, just like, I don't want them to think I'm being nosy. So the way that I enter into that question asking is, uh, I say, you know, I'm, I'm Dr. West, Dr. Ely, whatever. And I care about all of you. This is the, I exactly, kind of, I mean, I say variations of this, we kind of say, like, I care about all of you. And as your physician, I want to be able to help you with anything that you need me or want me to help you with. And so in order to do that, I know you're in here for a gallbladder problem, but if you're willing to tell me part of your story and other things about your life, that would help me, I think, to do a better job in caring for you. Something like that to get started so they don't think that I'm just prying into their life or something. Um, there's lots of ways to do that. And, um, and the way that I keep track of these stories, Evelyn, is that I record them down. Um, I, you know, during the, when I was writing EDDB, I actually recorded their stories on this device and I transcribed them all using rev.hub. And so I have drawers and drawers and drawers of transcripts. That's why I know, that's why all these quotes in here are actual direct quotes. They're not made up. They're not from my memory. You know, I'm recording them on this. I have three of these things. So I'm all over the place. And these are direct transcripts that were used in the book. But I also write down them a lot. I write them down a lot. Um, and so it's a combination of all of that. But I have a filing system in my office with all their stories and their names. And I never write, I never do any of that without their permission. I always get their permission. I never write down their name or medical record number or story unless I have their permission. And if they ever tell me that then I don't have their permission, then I don't keep it. So I'm extremely cautious about that. And all the people in this book have actual written written permission slips and everything. So it's all like it's always to be sued or something. I'm I'm good. I mean it's all covered. I, I wouldn't be, but but I mean the patients are all glad to be in here. But but anyway, I just want you to know I, I take that very seriously. And uh and by the way, I mean, you know, all the money from this book, all the proceeds go into an endowment where we're using all the money to hire social workers to create a, a community for survivors and their families. We're hiring social workers there. We're helping them apply for disability insurance status, all those things. Um, you can help draw people in. I mean, don't leave a, leave a review on Amazon or something. It'll all help to draw people into this, this mission of creating this community where people from any state, any institution, could you tell your patient, you can contact the SIP center and be part of their support groups. We've got 50 people on the wait list right now, but we're going to hire the social worker or expand our support groups. And we just want to do this for people for free. We're not charging any of these people any money. So that's what we're doing. We have our science side. We have $35 million in NIH funding and VA funding. We're doing about 40 different trials right now. And then we have our humanism side, which is all for free for patients and families. And this book, EDDB, became the, 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 the jumping off point for the humanism side for our research center. And we hope that other people will kind of copycat us and start doing this to other institutions. It's an amazing effort, Dr. Ely, and, um, you know, to, to be able to use your platform for, for such a great uh, change and impact. Um, I'm just, ha I have a quick comment that working with Tommy and Colin and Evelyn and, and others during their intern year has been one of the greatest privileges of my life. But clearly, as the time has gone by, they have emotionally gotten more and more mature. And I feel like I've emotionally regressed. I was um, very, I had been very deliberate about learning about my patients as people and, and their stories outside of the hospital, very much so as a resident, very much so as a general cardiology fellow. And I haven't really been doing that as an interventional cardiology fellow. And I've reflected on this, like, why, why is it? And I, I realized, and Dan will very much understand this, is, um, you know, we've all experienced loss. Uh, both personally, but also, you know, as, as physicians and in the hospital, but, but losing a patient after some, like, you know, on your table or shortly after them being on your table, it's just, it feels so different. You know, it's, it's something that you directly did or performed that either didn't go well or was poorly timed, or, you know, there's something about the natural progression of their disease that you weren't able to intervene on. And, and that kind of loss has really, uh, it's very challenging. It's been the, the most challenging kind of loss to experience in the hospital for me. And I think that, that not 
getting to learn the patients as people has been a way to almost like protect myself from that kind of loss, you know, and I, and the worst ones have been, you know, when you remember consenting them and, and sharing a chuckle with them or hearing about, you know, like I remember Dan was telling me about a patient he lost and he's, you know, he told me that what I remember most about that patient is, is, you know, like this is going to be an okay procedure. And he said bye to his wife uh, and said, I'll see you later. And, and he, and he said, he remembers the, the, the lip smack when, when she kissed him, you know, and that was the last time she saw it, you know, and, and again, it's something that you, you directly did that that's so clearly linked with their demise. It's been, um, I think, I think it's, it's very challenging. So, but I think if I'm going to take one thing away, there's so many things to take away from this. If there's one thing I'm going to take away is I'm going to go back to being deliberate about learning about my patients, not just as the mid LAD lesion or the low full gradient AS or the severe, you know, uh, eccentric MR, but, but to really kind of dig deep and go back to thinking about them and learning about them more as people, uh, before the procedure. So thank you. All right. You, you have your testimony and the other testimonials given tonight have enriched my soul so much. I I've never met with a group of people that I'm leaving so, so full as I am tonight all of you. I, I am absolutely blown away by who you are, why you got together. Everybody's been talking about what you've been teaching them on it as a, as a chief before and such. This is a powerful group of people that you have. There's something so special about what you have gathered together here. And what I want to say about what you just said is this, that when we meet another human being, they are an entire world. In the book, I say, cada persona es el mundo. Each person is the world. And how can I deprive myself of trying to understand what that, who that world is just to protect myself? That to me is selfish for me. I'm being selfish. Instead, I want to expand myself. I want to allow myself to be expanded, even if it makes me get hurt. Reread the story of Shonda in the book. She's on... She's on page 231 because she's not in the index. So she's going to be in the index for the paperback, which is coming out. But Sean is on 231. That she, I, I just thought, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? And then when I went back after she died, I will never forget that moment being with holding her arm, even she's dead. Um, we have to allow ourselves to be expanded and we will, we will get hurt but we will grow bigger in the process. And through that suffering, we will find our healing. The pain has to come out though, on it. It has, we have to write, we have to talk, we have to go to a counselor. We can't leave the pain bottled up because it's got to come out somewhere. But when it does come out, you're going to become a better healer and a better teacher for other people. And what you've already done for the, these people here will, will magnify so much. things real quick. Okay. Well, please go ahead. Please. The nursing home woman. So I was a phlebotomist. It was right after I'd been a farmer. I was going to medical school. I started to become a phlebotomist. Every day I drew her blood. Her, her tourniquet was on. I draw it. I believe they told me she was demented and I thought, oh, she's demented. She can't talk. So day in, day out, drawing her blood, drawing her blood. No words, no words. One day I walk in and don't freak. We haven't talked about spirituality. Every one of these entire universe of people has their own they may be atheist maybe agnostic maybe buddhist whatever it is understand that too that's part of who you're trying to heal so anyway i'm just gonna use the word god because what, what she said so the light was shining in her eyes beating the sun's beating in her eyes and i thought oh that's that can't be comfortable so i closed the curtain and i went over and i put the tourniquet on her arm like i had done many times before and she turned her head to me she had never said a single word to me ever and she said, all that is light is God. Whoa. This lady, I thought she was demented. I thought she had nothing in that brain. And that's what she said to me. All that is light is God. For years, I had been reading this column called Light One Candle about the Christophers. Um, the motto was, it's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. And that was my motto. Many years later, I wrote that story up of that lady in the nursing home and I sent it in to them and they put it in their 
in their uh, cowl, lime white candle. And then about a month ago, I was in Belgium at the Brussels meeting, uh, Jean Louis Vincent, the big European critical care meeting. And I got back to my, my uh, room one night late and opened up the internet and my email was there. And the Christophers had given EDDB the, the 2022 award for lighting one candle. So it's going to be cool on the, on the paperback and will have the emblem of the Christopher's, but it's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. And just remember that. And by lo by learning who somebody is, you're, al you're allowing their, their flame to flicker. That's what we can do. We can allow their flame to flicker brighter because we care who they are. So I know we're, I won't stop. I'll just, I, I won't read this, but, but I'll just do that. Go back, read that Shauna story. Go back and read about Clementine too. Read about Clementine Hunter on page 240, 241. You know, this woman made such an impact on me. She was my friend. She, her art is hung in the Louvre. Oprah Winfrey collects her art. But to me, she was a, an elderly, wrinkled black woman whose parents were slaves in the deep style who painted for me right upstairs in this very house is a painting by Clementine Hunter here in this house. And she told me, you know, this one of the hockey talk will be for us. And in life, people fight and they dance. And she said, Wes, you're going to have to figure out, are you going to dance more or fight more? And when I envision my time at the dead cell with my patients is that's the dance. That's the dance that I want to do with every person I meet, find out who they are, the universe that they are, and let that light shine bigger and brighter because of our interaction. So those are my thoughts. I appreciate you all so much. I'm sorry we, we went over time. We are so truly thankful to you for bringing us together and for giving us the space and the opportunity to reflect together. I think we all feel extremely blessed to be a part of the Cardio Nerds family and community and everything that Don, Dan and Abed have put together for us. And so thank you for giving us the sort of the vessel with which we could sort of take our feelings and, and reflect together and hopefully all be better doctors spread across the country because of you. So thank you so much. Let me know if I can ever do anything for any of you. My email is simple. It's just west.ely at vumc.org, Vanderbilt University Medical Center.org. Happy to engage with any of you at any time and uh, appreciate you all so much. Have a great night.